Today, somewhere on Earth is headed for the west of America, a land where the pioneering spirit and dreams of fortune still live on. Al Fall is a musician. He plies the deserted roads of Arizona at the wheel of his old taxi. The concerts he gives in the little towns keep him in close contact with the slice of genuine America. Richard Fox, who grew up in the mountains of Wyoming, has chosen to live close to nature. By running the family ranch, he's perpetuating the cowboy tradition of the American West. The mountains and canyons of Utah still echo with Indian chants. Steph Davis has made this her playground. Climbing, skydiving, and base jumping, this is the daily bread of this enthusiastic woman in search of the extreme. It kind of feels like being a bird when you have a wingsuit because you can go where you want, you can steer it, you can you know, spin around in circles. It's just such a, and just an amazing thing that you could do that, you know? You could be like a bird up there. It's just, it's kind of amazing that we have that chance. Al Fowl couldn't imagine his life any other way. For more than 20 years now, he's been living for and from his music, rock and roll. at the wheel of his old jalopy, travels Arizona's dusty desert scattered with cactus. It's like he stepped right out of another age, America of the 1950s. Al, an exceptional musician, has become a well-known figure of Arizona's rock scene. One fine day, while hitchhiking across the states with a friend, he decided to put down roots here. They were 18 and were pursuing their dreams of freedom. I wanted to go out to California. I was, I heard a lot about San Francisco and I had a few friends out there. But you see, we were kind of homeless at the time and had been pretty much on and off the street through most of our teenage years. So we would hitchhike in and uh, I wanted to go to California. And he says, it's October. It's gonna be real cold if we're gonna be sleeping outside in San Francisco in October. So he says, let's go to Arizona. I met some people, it's a cool little town and it's warm all winter long. I actually fell in love with Arizona when I first came here from the East Coast. The whole state is just filled with beautiful drives. I was getting ready for the show. I gotta get, my, you know, I was, I get pretty dirty driving around in this car, you know? So I just get you know, put on the good shirt for the gig. Music is his livelihood, and his old guitar is his most valuable possession. On the roadside, under a leaden sun, he carries out the same unchanging ritual before each concert. The guitar we used to be uh, like a red, like a red sunburst, and, uh, it had gotten smashed, actually. The whole thing got broken in, and when I repaired it, uh, I was gonna paint it a different color or paint, go back to the red sunburst. And when I primed it and sanded the primer, it kind of gave, like, it looked kind of like the taxi, actually. So I decided I'd just clear coat it like this, and it matches. Just about a hundred miles 
away, baby, and I'll be on soon. Truck chuckle over in the background, maybe I can barely make you out. Here comes another one rolling by. Cheers, everybody. Al often plays solo. Guitars, drums, singing. He's kind of a one-man band. He's also his own manager, always on the lookout for the next gig. Today, Al's making a stop at Kilako to see Ed a real character of the Far West, like you can meet in Arizona. Hey, Ed, how are you? Howdy. Really nice to see you again. All right, welcome to Cowtown Key Laco. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Haven't very much. seen you in a while. Oh, it's been a while, yeah. Yeah. You know, last night I was up in Tucson and I was playing a show and me and Marcus got to talking and we were thinking that maybe we could come out here. I'm thinking right around the last weekend of June. Maybe we could put on another concert out here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can do that. Or you can sit up on the stage. You know, it makes no difference. Uh, a lot of folks, just a few months ago, we had eight bands here. Okay. Yeah, I'll show you where uh, you can sit up. Now, well, come over here and, All right. yeah, you know, you can sit up here on the stage. And... Ed Kilico gave his name to this improbable spot, a little village that he planned and built himself. Kilako is a very special ranch with its own saloon, church, prison, and cemetery. Ed, a Korean and Vietnam War veteran, has spent his civilian life keeping alive the flame of the pioneering spirit of the Far West. You know, out here, people is treated with respect. Everyone is welcome in this town. It's the code of the West. You don't judge a person by the color of his skin. You judge him by the contents of his character. And that's what we do here. But somehow, the West is losing that. The deserts is a school where final examinations are given every hour, every day, every month. You have to understand, you learn to live in correlation with animals, with rattlesnakes, with Gila monsters. Everything that's here, you have to know where to find water because it looks green out there behind you, but that's a dangerous place. It can take your life. They'll find your bones weathered someplace. You have to know. Al the Rocker also has a kind of crazy dream. In Mammoth, a small town with a population of 2,000, he's renovating the Blue Front Inn. This bar is a legend unto itself. It used to be owned by the son of a Chicago gangster who made a fortune during Prohibition. The Blue Front Inn also used to be a dance hall. And maybe this place in the heart of the desert will come alive again. At least that's what Al is hoping. This is a 1965 Row Ambassador. I bought it in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. There's a guy who uh, 
I actually, the guy I bought it from had uh, three or four of them, and out of them, he took all the parts together and pieced together one working one. And I've filled it with all my own records and records that uh, I got from my father when he died. Driving is something I do all the time as a musician. I do a lot of driving. Even if I just stay in Arizona and just play my regular circuit of shows in Arizona, sometimes I'll do 1,200 miles in a month. And that's just for the gigs. Sometimes it's where I write songs because I have nothing else to do. My mind just starts to work overtime. But I like it. I like driving. Feels like you never make it home. 250 kilometers from Al's place, just a stone's throw for Arizona, is the town of Bisbee and the Shady Dell, a very original motel. Here, the rooms are all vintage trailers. This morning, Al is paying a visit to his friend Justin, the moving spirit of the place. Like Al, he's a great fan of the fabulous 50s. We don't have much of a history, and this, is a, this was a big part of our, our culture, between the car culture, the, the movies, and the old diners. And, and unfortunately, yeah, everything's fading away. Um, nobody knows what these diners were like anymore. They're, they're pretty much all gone. For me to, to get to Bisbee in the taxi, it's, you know, three hours with no air conditioning, holes in the bottom of the floor, you know, but uh, it's all part of the adventure, you know. If I wanted to drive a car with air conditioning and stuff, I mean, you know, that's not for me, you know. Good music, a head full of yarns inspired by his Mexican taxi, Al Fowl's life is written on the highways and byways of Arizona. Behind the wheel of his 1954 Chevrolet Bel Air, Al is a happy man. Yeah, man, I love it. I love this car. I can't stop anywhere without somebody saying, wow, man, that's a cool car. I love it. Trunk popped open. It's got a bad lock. I gotta close it again. Well, you see, none of these gauges work, you know, on the thing, and they never didn't when I got it. And to kind of replace them all is uh, you know, a little expensive and a little pain to do. So, you know. I don't know, you know, if I need to know how fast it is, you know, 50. I don't even know if I'm the one who owns the car. I think I'm just a passenger for a while. miles away. God bless America. Al's car is the faithful companion of every moment of his life. Something like a good old friend who every now and then gives you a hard time. Oh well, I'm gonna blow a tire, you're gonna blow a tire. And the first one I changed, I'm sure as hell ain't gonna be the last. Ugh. Just gotta get into Tucson and get another one now.
I've heard about Davy. He got locked up yesterday for the failure to pay his child support. And all us guys laughed and thought it was just so funny. His wife left in such a hurry. She never even stopped to ask for money. She never even called just once to tell him where her and Junior was. So last Friday night driving back to his lonely home, he started thinking. I, I, I'm not going to leave Arizona, I don't think. I mean, I want to travel. You know, I'd like to see the whole rest of the world, really, to tell you the truth. And I'm going to try to see as much of it as I can. I mean, part of the biggest thing about being a musician is it's kind of, it can be a tool for that. You know, maybe you ain't going to make any money there, but you're going to get to see some places, you know? And it's a vehicle like that, you know? It can be if you're, you know, if that's your intention, you know? But I always want to stay here, you know? I got a nice little circuit I do, you know, around the state, different gigs I've been doing for some years, different towns I've been playing for a long time. See old friends when I play there, and it's nice. I, I never want to lose that. He had a little yard sale. They you be closing dishes for sale. A little yard sale. They you be closing dishes for sale. A little yard sale. Baby clothes and dishes for sale. Wyoming is a land where people still get around on horseback. A land of breathtaking landscapes crossed by the Rocky Mountains that peak at over 4,000 meters. It is the least populated of the United States. Here, not far from Yellowstone National Park, Richard Fox has his ranch. It's the end of May. And uh, normally at this time of year, the grass is growing and all of the trees have leaves. But this year, as you can see, it's still snowing at this time of year. So uh, we're facing some challenges feeding our horses and our cattle. And uh, we, we live by nature's rules here. Richard Fox runs his family ranch perched at an altitude of 2,300 meters and isolated from the rest of the world. In this region, the temperature can sometimes drop to minus 30 or 40 degrees Celsius. Wyoming is a wild country, land of wolves, grizzlies, beavers, and the imposing elk. This morning, Richard is riding along the edge of the forest. He's tracked down a stray colt that ran off from the herd. I've been around horses. Um, you know, I started riding in my father's arms when I was six weeks old. So really, they're like family members to me. And my whole family feels the same way. We treat them very gently and, uh, you know, have a lot of respect for horses. Horses are wonderful because um, you can go so many places with them. You know, it's a little bit like a dog, except you can also ride them. <laughs> the horses and the cattle, I love the animals. Um, you know, it's always, you always feel at peace when you're around them. They're uh, you know, very pure animals. 
You know, you can go any direction on the horses. And we're very lucky because we're in the middle of the wilderness. So we don't have any highways. We don't have fences, you know, that block us off. So we can go any direction, both uh, physically and I think mentally, because we have these wide open spaces. When the sun sets, the mountains around the Bitterroot Ranch echo with a particular sound that goes way back to Richard's childhood. Once spring is well underway, they let the horses loose at sunset so they can spend the nights roaming freely in the mountains. I was born and raised in Wyoming, um, and I spent my whole childhood growing up here. And then I went away for university, uh, so I saw some other parts of the country, and I uh, experienced you know, different lifestyles, and realized how wonderful my lifestyle here in Wyoming is. Um, and I think that's part of the reason that I love it so much. You know, I've seen other things, and uh, I've, I've seen how lucky I am and my family is to be here. But I was lucky because I was born into this lifestyle. So I think many people have to search, you know, for something they love and, you know, for a passion in life. And for me, it was just natural. After a long, hard winter, the spring thaw has begun. The ranch is coming back to life. Today, Richard's entire family is pitching in with the work. They have to drive a part of the herd up to the grazing lands recently freed from the snow. These vast expanses they ride over, these plains, hills, and mountains, all this is their home, and they protect it. Um, you know, we do things the way they've been done in the West for over 100 years. Um, we, you know, we rely on the natural world, the grass growing, and the cattle having their calves. Uh, just, just like the cowboys did in the old days. <laughs> this is uh, not a very decorative saddle. This is a real cowboy saddle for work. It's designed to sit in for a lot of hours. You're comfortable in this saddle all day. It's, uh, it's like my office chair that I sit in every day. As long as it's uh, looked after and, you know, I keep loving it, it should last for, you know, generations. Um, actually, my parents got this saddle for me when I graduated from high school. 
So I've had it for many, many years. And maybe, I don't know, I'll give it to my son when he graduates from high school. <laughs> I like to come up just by myself to get away from it all and uh, see what's going on up here. Um, it's very peaceful, it's very nice companionship with the horses. You know, you always have to pay attention to what the horse is doing. Um, and so they keep you thinking. Uh, you can't fall asleep and I can't drift off and, and think about other things. I have to focus on the horse and on our relationship. Um, it's a little bit like a, a dance, and you have to pay attention to it, or you'll step on your partner's toes, <laughs> or they'll step on yours. I came up here this morning to uh, see if we can bring our cattle up into the mountains. Each summer we bring them up, you know, high uh, into the mountains for, uh, for the grass. And I've discovered that there's a lot of snow up here. So it's too early, we aren't going to be able to bring our cattle up yet. But uh, frankly, it's also kind of a nice trip to see, um, you know, just me with the two horses and uh, we get away from it all and we can explore in the mountains, it's very peaceful. I haven't found anywhere yet that's better than this. <laughs> yeah. Richard makes a stop on the banks of this river. He still has half a day of riding to get back to the ranch. He'll spend the night in his 100-year-old cabin that has offered shelter to so many cowboys before him. Isolated, but not alone. He has the company of his horses, as well as the spirit of all those who once nourished the same dreams. Many ranches in the West are getting subdivided. Um, you know, so they're being sold for people to have small houses in this beautiful countryside. But of course, as more people have their small homes in paradise, it's no longer paradise. And, um, and so, I think for my whole family, it's very important that we're keeping our ranch the way that it has been. Um, it's a hard way to make a living, and it would be easy to you know, sell the ranch and subdivide it. Uh, but there are a lot of ranchers that hold on to the land. Even though it's a tough lifestyle, it's a good lifestyle, and they have a lot of love for what they're doing and for the open land and for the environment. I hope people get a chance to visit wilderness somewhere in the world just to see what it's like. And I think that, you know, that's how everyone used to live. So it's kind of part of us and it's important to, you know, still see it. At dawn, Richard will get back on the trail to the ranch. In a few days, the snow will be all gone. That's when they'll drive the cattle up to the summer pastures. In the local Indian language, Utah means people of the mountains. This is the breathtaking realm of towering stone cathedrals sculpted by the wind and rain. Time and erosion have carved out immense canyons. Venturing into the heart of Utah means discovering one of nature's masterpieces.
here at the foot of these abrupt rock walls is where the lovers of wide open spaces meet. Men and women who live near these cliffs that they've managed to tame in order to satisfy their thirst for the extreme. It's like a specific moment where you have to focus and do everything the best you can. And um, you know, the only person it really matters to is you because you're the one there, you're the one on the line. It feels really honest or like real to um, have experiences like that because you're gonna try to do the best you can because you sort of have to. Well, I've been climbing for 20 years, and um, you know, at this point, I couldn't really not climb in my life. It's just, you know, it's like eating or walking. I mean, I just, I will always climb. Um, I don't know. I don't know why I like that so much. I just, I just do. I, I just really like it. What makes sense is being here, and you know, you're on a cliff and there's gravity and you, know, and you have your equipment and you know what to do and you're gonna do the best you can because you wanna have a good time and, and be able to do it again later and it's just, it's very natural. So to me that makes sense and I like to live like that. Steph Davis is one of the world's most respected woman climbers. She has climbed and opened difficult trails all over the globe. Pakistan, Europe, North and South America. Steph Davis could have had a brilliant career as a pianist or devoted herself to writing and literature. But one day she discovered rock climbing the contact with the stone, and this wild nature that few men or women manage to master. When she arrived here in Moab, Utah, Steph Davis decided to live as simply as possible, in her trailer, not far from the rock walls. And she lived like that for seven years. I love this this place where there's all these canyons and all of this, um, there's a lot of shape and there's like a lot of um, volume <laughs> in this landscape. And then you never feel like you're just out exposed because there's so much stuff surrounding you, but then it's far away. So you don't feel like squeezed in like some tight valley. So it's just this really nice combination of feeling kind of like there's things surrounding you, but you always feel like you're up on top of places and it just feels really good here. You know, as the years went by, I went like a lot of places in the world and this is just my favorite place. Like if I, if I had to stay in Moab and never ever leave this area for the rest of my life, I would be totally happy because there's just everything to do here. Now Steph lives with her boyfriend, Mario, who's also a lover of the extreme and strong sensations. Today, they're climbing ancient art, a spire in the middle of Fisher Towers, one of Utah's most spectacular landscapes. Thank you. 
position and everything. Make sure it's all good. Okay, I'm not gonna right now. These two climbers, used to high mountains, complete the ascension in under an hour. Here, Steph and Mario are on the summit of ancient art, perched on a narrow platform barely large enough to stand on. Good one, babe. Yeah. Three, See ya. Two, one. Steph's free fall down the cliff face has gone off without a hitch. This sport, base jumping, gives an incredible rush of adrenaline. But for Mario, it's more of a problem because the wind has come up. Plus, he's no longer attached by his harness and his balance is tricky. Under these conditions, you have to be patient. Now the wind has dropped and Mario is getting ready to take the great leap. But first he has to get rid of the rope they use to make the climb. The rope has gotten wedged in and he has to free it with his foot. Yeah, baby, here we go. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Good job. That was a nice one. It's one of those magical places, and it's close to our hometown. It's like 20 miles away, 25 miles away. We can come here like every day if we want to, so we don't have to travel across the world. So, and people cross the world to come here. So when you're actually here and you, it's your backyard, it's I mean, I feel very very lucky. You know, I'm more of a jumper, she's more of a climber. So she gets me up and, you know, I get her down. So we have this little team thing going, which is pretty nice. So when you actually have somebody that shares the same passion and you're actually in love with, it makes everything just that much more intense because you just, you can share all these very strong, you know, feelings and moments with somebody, somebody you love. It's nice, very nice. <laughs> Storms, they, they bring all the air up and then it just takes air in from different sides.
Mario is a climber, but he's also been an airplane pilot and skydiving instructor for years. He's one of the trailblazers of base jumping as well. The passion they both have for wide open spaces and pushing their limits quite naturally led Steph and Mario to share the call of the void. Mario and I actually met in this plane. <laughs> and I, I really like it when he's flying. And then he knows so much, and I really trust his decisions. Um, and it's just, it's just nice when he's flying. If you're in a thunderstorm, it's bad weather. So what you need to do is make sure where they are before you actually take off and um, basically avoid them. But it does make things a little more tricky, but at the same time, these days we'll have the most beautiful skies because the clouds are bursting and there's a way to be safe as long as you respect um, the environment and you know what's coming. Their little plane is weaving between the storms and downpours. Mario is still hesitating about opening the hatch. Steph is ready to go. It's got a how about is one minute from drop it's got a those up for Kangaroo. One minute. And door, wait five miles. Have a good job. For this jump, Steph has donned her wingsuit specially designed to slide through the air. But man's oldest dream, flying, is not available to just anyone. In the USA, you have to complete 500 jumps before you can dive with a wingsuit. The suit allows Steph to fly much longer in free fall than with the standard equipment. It's an aerial roller coaster that lasts only about one minute before opening her parachute. It kind of feels like being a bird when you have a wingsuit because um, you can go you can go where you want you can steer it you can pop up or dive down you can you know spin around in circles it's a really cool feeling but then at the same time you're also um, thinking a lot because you have instruments like the altimeter and you have to think about where you're going to come to land and. So it's like, on the one hand, it's this really like, ooh, I'm a bird. And then on the other hand, you're like, what's my altitude? <laughs> it's just such a, and just an amazing thing that you could do that, you know? You could be like a bird up there. It's just, it's kind of amazing that we have that chance. When I started to do meditation, for me it's just kind of the same thing as running. Like, I like to have like the empty mind state, which is really good. And then, um, and then you feel good, and then um, it helps train your mind to do that when you are like doing a base jump or doing a hard climb or free soloing or skydiving or something. Because anything you practice, you can do it better. So if you practice that uh, mind state in safe environments, it's easy to take it into the risky ones. Hey, Larry. 
Hey, Steph, how's it going? Hi, Slack. Hi. Hey, Hi, Steph. sweetie. Hey. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Happy dog. Hi. Good boy. Is it windy? Yeah, it's been a little breezy up here, but not too bad. Is the line good? Oh, it's perfect. Looks nice. Yeah, it's oh, great. That's super nice, Larry. Yeah, it's sweet. Wow, but it's really wet. Is the line wet? Uh, no, it's actually after uh, the sun and all the wind, it's dried out and it's perfect. Do you know how far down it is? Uh, it's probably about 100 feet down. Okay. Larry Harp is an old friend of Steph and Mario. He's a reference in this very spectacular discipline, <laughs> slacklining. He also has been around the world to fulfill his passion for climbing, which he's been practicing for years. Oops. Larry is willing to go to great lengths for such a moment. It took him two days of hard work to set up the line. You don't practice this extreme sport on a tight cable, like a tightrope walker with his balancing pole. Here, Larry has to master the stretch and bounce of the narrow strip of webbing as he walks the fine line between vertigo and perfect balance. <laughs> I really enjoy the balance of being able to control not only your physical and your mental aspect of, of walking a line. Um, I enjoy being up really high. I've been a climber for 20 years, so highlining or slacklining up high is basically just an extension of that. One thing you try to do is, is empty your mind of anything. It's kind of like meditation, so um, if you're thinking about a bunch of things while you're walking, it just it, it kind of confuses you and it, it, it might make you stumble or fall. Whew, that was fun. It's always, <laughs> always gets the heart rate up a little bit there. For me, highlining is all about uh, the, uh, the view, and it's not just, just being up high, it's being in a very scenic place, being, in, being out with nature and just enjoy, enjoying the, uh, the landscape, and everything encompasses the experience that, that you're looking for. <laughs> 